Come on up. Would y'all give it up for Logan Dodd? Preacher. Logan Dodd. Proud of you, buddy. Thank you. All right. We got your stand coming up in a second. Logan's going to bring the word tonight. I'm excited. Uh, I've already taken too much time away from you because I know you got a 50-minute message, so get ready. All right. Wake up. Shake loose. All right. Get your notes ready. This guy is extremely intelligent. Extremely intelligent. What was your GPA? 5.4. 5.4. All right. How do you even get a 5? Is that real? Mine was like a 2.3, bro. That's three points higher. Okay. I'm done. Just be the youth pastor. Okay. I'm kidding. Um, you would do a great job. Uh, Logan's going to bring a great word. I want to pray for you. I know God's put a word on your heart, and you're going to share it with us. I'm proud of you. Thank, thankful for you. Um, thankful you get to lead your people tonight and, you know, share with them, teach them. By the way, this isn't Logan, you know, being placed on a pedestal. Like, look at Logan. This is Logan being humble, saying, God, would you speak through me? Because I'm nothing. I am just, I just want to be used by you. And I think your story in your life is a huge part of that. I'm excited for you to share some of that. So, God, I pray for Logan. God, would you speak through him now? Lord, would you use these words? Would we tune in and listen to what you want to say tonight? God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for what you're doing in his life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, like Seth said, my name's Logan. I'm so thankful to be here tonight. Seth asked me about three weeks ago to come up here and speak, and I've been preparing ever since. Um, and I'm really excited because I do think that the passage that the Lord has kind of led me to is something that we can all draw from tonight. The, past, the title of my message is God Ordains, and I kind of want to start off with this key truth that, we're all go- that all of what I'm going to talk about is going to stem from this. It says, God has ordained every person, action, and moment from the beginning of time for his glory and for our good. Now, ordain may not be a word that you're familiar with, and so ordain is simply to establish or order by appointment, decree, or law. So I want to tell you a story. There's something that kind of sets this tone of ordaining. So every year we would go to Florida for spring break, me and my whole family. I think I have a picture up here. Um, We would go to Florida like clockwork on spring break. We would never, ever miss it. And one year we're going to Florida and we're driving, and naturally, here's that picture, we may never beat the homeschool allegations. Um, So that's all nine of us in the suburban driving 10 hours to Florida. So we were driving, and we take a different turn this year. We went the same place, Deerfield Beach, every single year. So we turned differently, and we were just like, oh, we must be going, we must have traffic, there must be something different, so we're just going to go with it. So we keep going, and we start playing Would You Rather?, And it's a typical car game that most of you might be familiar with. And so we're going, asking dumb questions. And my aunt decides that she's going to join the game. And so we're like, okay, whatever. And so she asks, she says, would you rather keep driving for three hours and go to Deerfield Beach? Or would you rather go to Disney World and stay in Orlando for a few days? Little did we know they were actually being serious. We were like, go to Disney World. And she's like, well, that's where we're going. And so we all erupt into tears and we start going to Disney World. So God works in a very similar way. We think that we know exactly when, what, and why God is going to do what he's doing, but we obviously don't. We think we know what we want, but God has a much, much better plan, and ultimately, he's chosen that from the beginning of time. And we're going to see that tonight in a story of a figure named Cyrus. Just for a little bit of context, uh, this is way, way back in the Old Testament. Um, Israel had been separated into two kingdoms, and the southern kingdom had been taken captive by Babylon. If any of you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Daniel in the lion's den, this is about that same period of time. They were conquered again by the Persian Empire, and a king named Cyrus is on the throne. And this is where we pick up our story, is God is telling Isaiah 200 years before he was even born what he's going to do through this man named Cyrus. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 45, if you want to turn in your Bibles there. We're going to be using verses 1 through 13 says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by, my, by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. 
I am the Lord and there is no other, and besides me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the Lord open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout, because I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who formed it, What are you making, or your work has no handles? Woe to him who says to a father, What are you begetting? Or to a woman, With what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, Ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the works of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hand that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their host. I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the opportunity that I have to share your word. I pray that you would just speak through me, uh, calm my nerves, and just help me to say what it is that exactly you want me to say. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing that I want to say about Cyrus before I get into some of my points is that Cyrus was a Gentile. Seth talked about this a little bit last week, but there was a huge divide between Jews and Gentiles. Jews were God's chosen people. From the time of Abraham in the very beginning of the Bible, God had chosen the Jews to be his chosen people. And the Gentiles were everyone else. They were kind of seen as the other to the Jews, especially when they were known for having a relationship with God, it was almost seen as impossible for a Gentile to be used by God and to have a relationship with him. And so the three specific things that I want to talk about tonight that God ordains, and this is not everything, but three specific things, is people, events, and ultimately our salvation. So the first is people. At the very beginning of the passage, we see God call out Cyrus specifically by name. It says in verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. There are multiple other places in the Bible where God does this, but he speaks to someone long before they're born and says, this is who I'm going to use. If you think about Jesus, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her, I'm going to use your son. If you think about Isaac, God tells Abraham that his descendants are going to be like the stars. We see this constantly through the Bible, but also today, God calls people for a specific purpose. And you may be saying, oh, Logan, I mean, I know my parents. I know Seth and Alexis have been chosen by God. I know there's missionaries and pastors and things like that. But ultimately, God has a plan for all of us. When we step into that plan, we know what's best and God knows what's best. And the thing is, is that God wants to choose you as well. God created you. In Psalm 139, it says he forms you in your mother's womb. And God has a specific plan for you. And you may be saying, well, I may be too sinful. I don't know what it is that God has for me. I don't really know. Well, look at Cyrus. Cyrus was a Gentile, which, as I said before, he was seen as not able to even have a relationship with God. And he was a violent man. History tells us that Cyrus conquered all the way from India to Greece. So whenever you think about someone who God's going to use, you think about David or Moses or Jesus, these men who... Uh, submitted themselves before God long before, and then it came after. But ultimately, God chooses to use Cyrus, and all that took was him stepping into what God had for him. All that you have to do, just like Cyrus, is you have to step into what God has for you. You pray, and you read your Bible, and you seek wise counsel, and ultimately, God will reveal exactly what he has for you. God has a plan for you, and he wants what's best. And ultimately, that plan is what is what's best. Because in verse 9, it says, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe here is not like the woe that we used today, like, Whoa, 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 what's going on? Or what's, what's happening? It's almost like cursed. Woe was used in this time ultimately to say, You need to be extremely careful and you're going down the wrong path. God is saying here that the one who strives with him, the one who goes away from what God has, is ultimately cursed. And then, God get, not only does God say to people who are going away from his plan that they're cursed, but he gives an assurance of blessing to the people who are following him. 
In verse 14, later in the chapter, it says, Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God besides him. So ultimately, God has a plan for you. When you follow that plan, he will bring blessing. This, this, path, this verse says, the wealth of Egypt. Egypt, if any of you know anything about ancient history, was the wealthiest nation in all the world. The merchandise of Cush, Cush was a place known for the fine goods it made and sent to other places. And the men of, the Sabians, men of stature, were men who were known for being fierce warriors. God is saying, when you step into what I have for you, when you follow my plan, ultimately, blessing will follow. So while we don't follow God for his blessing, what happens naturally is God blesses us when we follow him. The next thing that I want to address is how God ordains events. We as Christians love to throw around the phrase, nothing takes God by surprise. Raise your hand if you've heard that phrase this week. I feel like constantly Christians are saying, nothing takes God by surprise. And ultimately, we should take comfort in that. We know that we serve a God who knows everything and who has ultimately decided everything that's going to happen, and that's something that we should take comfort in. But the thing is, is that while the bad things we take comfort in, we should also take comfort in the good things as well. Many times I find myself blaming God for bad things that happen, but the good things that happen, I'm just like, oh, I guess it just happened. I guess I just got lucky. But the reality is, is that God has chosen everything. How can we have so much blame in our hearts, but yet so little thanks? And ultimately, this is from our sin nature. But the passage again points to how God ordains even events. Verses 2 and 3 say, I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. Here we see that God is going before Cyrus. He's saying things like, I'm going to level the exalted places, break, the pieces, break in pieces the doors of bronze. God is saying here that he is going to go before Cyrus and ultimately accomplish these things himself. God is going to do great things, but the thing is, is that none of these things sound like beneficial things. Level, break, cut. A lot of times, God works through negative events, and the Israelites would have seen this negatively because they were going to be conquered again. Because of their sin, Israel had gone through cycle after cycle of exile and conquering, and ultimately, those were not seen as good things. But Cyrus had to, get, had to be, be on the throne again and be chosen by God so that the good and the blessing could follow. I want to share a story with, and after these 70 years, God would ultimately bring Israel back to their home. In Ezra, which is 200 years after this is written, Cyrus makes a decree saying, Whoever is among all of you, all of his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus says here, after doing what these Israelites would have seen as terrible things, Cyrus says, I'm going to bless you. God has called me, and ultimately I'm going to let you go back and rebuild God's temple. So I want to share a personal story with you about a time where there was something that was ultimately seen as negative, but that God has used for my benefit. Many of you know that I live with my aunt and uncle, and I have since I was seven years old. Uh, but before that, I did live with my biological mom and dad. And it was a very tumultuous growing up. My uh, parents fought a lot. They uh, used substances and ultimately just lots of neglect. And so one, whenever I was seven years old, my mom decided with her new boyfriend at the time that she was going to, we were all going to move down to Myrtle Beach. And so me and my brother at six and four years old were like, oh, like Myrtle Beach, we're so excited. We're going to move down there and it's just going to be a great time. Well, we get down there, we take all our stuff out of the car, it's the nighttime, we wake up the next morning, and we'd been eating breakfast, and my mom decides that she's, we're going to go down to the beach. So we start walking, and it was a hot morning, it's Myrtle Beach in August, this was right before school started, and so we're walking to the beach, we're going, and me and my brother are like little kids running ahead of our mom, and we go, and we get to the beach access, and we turn around, and my, me and my 
brother see my mom collapse on the ground. And we go over there and we like try to wake her up and nothing's working. And me and my brother are like, what's going on? Like just ultimately confused. And so I run over to, uh, I run over to this woman who was sitting there with her family and I say, can you please help me? Like my mom is collapsed over here on the beach. I need help. And so long story short, uh, God gave me the recall to remember that my aunt and uncle were not at home, but at their, our grandparents' lake house. He gave me the recall to remember their phone number that was at the lake house. And ultimately, 30 minutes before DSS comes and takes me and my brother to go to foster care, my mom's second cousin, who happened to be on Facebook at the time, responded to a message and comes and picks us up before my aunt makes the five-hour drive all the way to Myrtle Beach so that we can live with them up until now. And so while that may seen, be seen as a terrible event, and it was terrible at the time, God has used it to take me into a home where I've known nothing but love and ultimately God's love because that is what God knew that I needed. God used that event to show me exactly what he has for me. And so the last thing that I want to talk about, it, and ultimately what that was, was that God was using those events for his glory. While it has benefited me, ultimately God used that for his own glory and to be, make his name greater known. Because now I have a relationship with him and I have the opportunity to share God's goodness and how he chooses to use certain people, events, and salvation with you tonight. The last point that I want to share with you is how God ordains salvation. From the beginning of time, God has been passionate about saving his people. We see this first in the Old Testament with the Jews. We see how God has, all, has ultimately chosen to save them time and time and time again. But after Jesus' death on the cross, that's extended to all of us. We all have the opportunity to experience salvation. But we need, we need two types of salvation as people. We need, ultimate, we need eternal salvation. We need saving from our sins. We need to know that assurance that we're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. But we also need temporary salvation. We need salvation from every experience, every event, every circumstance that we face in this broken world. And we need to know that God has our back in this. The one, this example of Cyrus is one of many where God does provide that temporary salvation. He uses someone who was unlikely. He uses an, a king to ultimately bring salvation to his people. We see that he lets them out of exile and he sends them back to bring salvation to them. We see in verse 5 this temporary salvation that God offers them. It says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you though you do not know me. God is saying here that I am the one who wants to be with you. I am the one who's going to save my people. But when you get later in the chapter, you see that God is not only talking about something that's going to last until Israel falls into sin again. We see God foreshadowing to Isaiah the story of Jesus and how he will ultimately provide our eternal salvation. This, verse 23 say, or verses 21 through 25 say, And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and Savior. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. And to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. We see here that not only is God offering salvation to the Jews, but after Jesus comes, he is going to offer salvation to all of the world. And that was something that was seen as unlikely at the time. The Jews took pride that they were God's chosen people and that they were the ones who knew God and that they had a relationship with him. But we see here that God is foreshadowing that moment that we are in right now where whenever you receive salvation, you have that eternal hope of knowing that you're going to spend eternity in heaven with God. There is no circumstance that God doesn't offer us salvation from. There is everything that we need, God offers us. And ultimately, he is there waiting with his arms open, saying, I want you to fall back into me. We are called to trust him with every single circumstance and ultimately our eternity. 
And that is that ultimate, and that ultimate thing that we need saving from is eternity separated from God in hell. Our sin separates us from God, and there is nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. God knows that, and he knew that we needed a Savior who could not, who could live a perfect life and die a perfect death so that we could spend eternity with him. And Jesus came and did that. And the entire passage, this whole story of Cyrus, yes, it does show us the history, and it shows us what God is going to do, but it, even further, it points to Jesus. It shows us that Jesus is ultimately the greater Cyrus. Jesus does what Cyrus cannot by giving us eternal salvation. Cyrus provided the Israelites with, uh, with time and with money and with resources so that they could go back and rebuild the temple. But ultimately, Israel would be conquered again by the Romans. And we know that once we receive salvation through Jesus, we ha- there is no chance of us being conquered ever again. Jesus, like Cyrus, was an unlikely man. He was ordained from the beginning of time. And he, he saved God's chosen people because he, we are made in the image of God. And so now we are all God's chosen people. So I'm going to read one last passage. And then I have a couple of questions for you to think on before we sing again. It's in Romans chapter 8. And it says, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul here is saying that we have that eternal hope. We have that salvation that Jesus wants to offer us, and all we have to do is accept it. And once we do, there is nothing that will ever be able to separate us from that. So the first question that I want to ask you is that question of salvation. Do you know that you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you know that you're a sinner? Do you know that Jesus came and lived a perfect life and did what we cannot? Because that is the most important decision that you can ever make. And I cannot stress that enough that you need to have a relationship with Jesus. And so if that's something that you know that you don't have tonight, I'm so excited to tell you that you, you don't have to leave here that same way. Because... I want to share with you how you can enter into a relationship with Jesus. It's as simple as praying a prayer. And while this prayer does have some significance, it's not the words. What ultimately comes from this is the attitude of your heart saying that you want to turn towards Jesus. And the prayer is something like this, and you don't have to pray it out loud. You can pray it in your heart, but it says, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I cannot do anything to please you. And I know that I need your salvation. I trust in what Jesus did for me on the cross, and I want to spend my life honoring you and doing what I can to glorify you. And so if you prayed that prayer, if you realize that in your heart tonight, whether you're a student or whether you're an adult, there are lots of people here who would love to share that with you because that's ultimately a decision that you want to share with. Uh, It is the greatest joy that I have in my life, most of my friends have in their life because they know that they have an eternal salvation with Jesus for eternity. The second question that I want to ask you is about events. Every one of us has a story in this room. And it, while it may be some, a story where you grew up in church your whole life and God saved you when you were a child and you just have lived your life for him ever since, or whether it's one where it's full of sin and God's redemption, there is something here for all of us that we have to glorify God in. We know that God uses events in our life, and so I want you to pray and ask God, what events in your life do I not see you in? What events in my life am I just not looking hard enough? Because God is with us in every single detail of our life, and he wants to be. So I would ask that you would pray and ask God, show me what it is that you are working in this, Show me what it is, how it is that you want me to glorify you through these hardships right now. And the last question that I want to ask you is, some of you in here may already know God as your Savior. Some of you may be seeing him work in your life right now, but you don't know personally what it is that God has for you. As a senior, this is something, the question that I've been asking myself for a long time is, 
What is it that God has for me? After high school, what is it that I feel God calling me to? What career, what path, what college, what's next? And so I want you to think about and pray about, okay, God, what is this next step that you have for me? What is it that you want me to do? And ultimately, how can I glorify you most? Because that is what our life on earth is all about. So I want you to pray and I want you to take some time and pray and ask God because the reality is, is that it's not gonna be just a one-time prayer where you're just gonna pray and God's gonna tell you, you're supposed to be a missionary. You're supposed to be a surgeon. You're supposed to be an engineer. It's not gonna work like that. We ultimately pray, we seek wise counsel, like I said earlier, and we read scripture because that is how God speaks to us. And it may take a long time. For some of you freshmen in here, you may not know until spring semester, your senior year, what it is God has for you. But ultimately what God wants is just that relationship with him that comes when we seek him and when we ultimately find him. So I'm gonna pray for us and we're gonna continue in worship. And I want you to think about in your life, how God ordains you, how he's calling you, what events it is that he wants to use through you and ultimately, how is God calling you into deeper relationship with him? Whether it's turning from your sin for the first time or whether it's just seeking what he has for you, just think about and pray about what it is that ultimately God has chosen and ordained for you. God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the opportunity that we have just to gather and to worship you. I pray that you would continue to speak through the band and through this time of prayer that we're gonna have with the seniors. And I pray that you would just help us to glorify you and to look to you for what it is that you've chosen for us in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray.